Hi, I'm John McGregor. I work for Robert Bosch GmbH in Germany in software research. This edition of uh, ELC seems to be morphing into a kook's tour of home and work offices of Linux enthusiasts across North America and around the world. So I'd like to welcome you to my home office. Unfortunately, circumstances have not permitted that I show it to you, but welcome nonetheless. Kuntz, age ago, I worked as a Unix uh, de developer programming in C. More recently, about 10 years ago, I worked at Bosch on uh, Android applications in IoT. Uh, during that activity, I started attending embedded Linux conferences. About five years ago, I got the opportunity to uh, work with the SIL2 Linux MP project, which is a privately funded public project that tried to certify a uh, Linux-based safety critical application at the SIL2 level under IEC 61508. When that project ended, I started working with the ELISA project, which is a Linux Foundation project that is uh, working on enabling the use of Linux in safety applications. Um, Linux, it, ELISA isn't uh, focusing on any particular standard, uh, but uh, a considerable proportion of the participants come from the auto industry and the interest in um, the ISO 2662 aspects of safety certification are is considerable. Um, last year at the Embedded Linux Conference in Europe uh, at the Safety Summit, I made a presentation that basically said that we should learn to walk before we try to run with uh, safety certification of Linux. And I presented a number of uh, measures that we could uh, use uh, in that direction. Um, one of them was uh, ensuring that the safety uncritical parts of the system still meet the uh, expectations of the uh, accreditors and the safety certification agencies. This presentation is a result of the investigation that we did into that. Um, my co-author, uh, Nicole Papler, who worked as an accreditor, um, and I decided to start with ISO 26262. That turned out to be a good start because um, 26262 is uh, yeah tailored to uh, a, a more representative uh, cross section of industry that uh, produces uh, uh, consumer products uh, for the mass market, um, and uh, the Authors have made some thoughts about uh, how to use um, components in the development process. The topic is obscure and uh, the corresponding tech terminology is uh, obscure. I've tried to um, make the presentation more accessible, but uh, it's hard to know exactly uh, who's going to be uh, watching it. I assume that it's either uh, embedded Linux uh, enthusiasts that are interested in safety aspects or uh, people from the automotive industry that are interested in certifying um, open source software. It may not be admirable of me that I decided to record this presentation, but it has the advantage that uh, when it, I will be attending the uh, presentation and uh, as the presentation unfolds I'll be able to answer your questions in the chat and I invite you to uh, provide questions. So the next question is obviously how's it going to unfold? Well we're going to take a look at the, the challenges involved in the situation uh, in which they occur. Then we're going to look at the quality management areas that uh, ISO 26262 touches. 
Then the role that uh, quality assurance plays in uh, ensuring functional safety for safety critical products. Then after that, we will look at uh, the strategies for um, uh, using safety on critical software in a safety critical application and take a look at how those uh, strategies would be applied to Linux. And then we're done. So the situation is that, um, yeah, system integrators um, in automotive companies are uh, looking at uh, um, complex safety critical automotive systems. Yeah, you can have uh, software controlled uh, power window controlled units when you want. But I don't think you'd really consider uh, using Linux for uh, uh, those products. Um, you're probably looking at uh, products like uh, in-vehicle infotainment applications, where you know, the safety, it's not exactly safety critical, but there are safety critical aspects, or in uh, instrument cluster uh, applications as well. Um, some part, people are even considering using Linux in autonomous uh, driving applications, and there, um, yeah, the safety criticality is a considerable factor in uh, the overall system. At any rate, the systems consist of uh, components, and the components can uh, be uh, in themselves safety critical, or they can be safety uncritical, uh, or they can have a mixture of safety critical and uh, safety uncritical functionality. Uh, the point is, however, that uh, components are off the shelf. And that means that rather than being developed from scratch, uh, they're integrated into the, the system. Um, if you take a look at open source components, obviously the source code is available. But that source code could be provided by uh, commercial agencies, not necessarily taken directly from the uh, open source projects repository. It might be from a distributor or for, you know, it might be um, from a um, consultant. Um, because the development process is the critical to uh, the safety application considerations, um, yeah, hopefully there's some information about the development process that was used in producing the component. Because it's a selection process, the source code should not be modified, but um, it could be trimmed up extraneous functionality uh, before you uh, try to certify it. That simplifies the uh, challenge quite a bit. Uh, this presentation is about safety, but when you're selecting a component, there are other considerations. Um, uh, the component uh, may have to may uh, have security vulnerabilities. You'll have to investigate that. Actually, um, security uh, aspects are um, also safety significant because uh, you know, when the um, the system is hacked, the behavior of the system is not predictable. There are also aspects of uh, embargo constraints that uh, yeah, certain governments may not allow products coming from another country or including uh, components from uh, other countries. Uh, you have to understand the target market and uh, the uh, source of where the, the components are coming from. And there's the typical Linux product problems of uh, licensing and uh, the component could be vulnerable to patent trolls and license trolls. Um, yeah, these are all selection and issues and not necessarily safety relevant. And uh, this presentation is only about the, the safety relevant aspect. So uh, in a safety critical uh, system, there is safety critical functionality, uh, which is um, functionality that maintains the system in a safe state or brings it back to a safe state after a hazard event. Um, this is the uh, 
parts of the software or the system that is actually um, certified by the to a particular standard and it's accredited to, according to its integrity level. Uh, depending on uh, the severity of the uh, impact of a, a hazard event, um, there, the standards may require higher levels of integrity uh, in the um, in the component, and uh, that usually means that a higher degree of uh, rigor is required in the development process. And safety uncritical functionality is uh, usually just developed with the, the normal bog standard quality process. In contrast to uh, uh, safety critical functionality, the uh, safety critical uh, uncritical functionality or off the shelf components in general are qualified uh, to be used in the safety critical systems. That means that the system integrator first has to choose a particular uh, component. Yeah. In the case of operating systems, you could have the choice between using an RTOS and Linux, perhaps. Um, and then after the um, system integrator has made his decision, then he has to justify that s decision to the uh, uh, creditor. Um, a basic problem is that uh, um, Open source projects don't manage qual quality like uh, commercial organizations. At the beginning of the uh, 2000 years, um, the British uh, the Ministry of Health commissioned a study into the applicability of Linux to medical devices. And the consultants that wrote the report came up with the term software of unknown pedigree, where pedigree is basically a certification um, that uh, um, an animal like a dog or a horse uh, is a purebred. And similarly, uh, in black uh, British humor, the, the, the implication was that uh, open source doesn't have this pedigree because they don't use uh, the standard development process and they're more like mongrels. So the goal of this presentation is to explore the uh, actions possible to get QM accreditation for safety on critical functionality. Uh, the Siltu Linux MP project, ELISA, Zephyr, and Zen projects um, are all addressing uh, safety certification of open source components. Uh, and this presentation, as I said, uh, reflects a walk before you run approach. Um, <clears throat> the vast uh, majority of the um, code in the system is going to be um, safety uncritical and it's probably a good idea to look at that first. So <clears throat> what does QM, uh, what does uh, ISO 2662 think about QM? Um, as I heard conversations at the office, I didn't quite understand what they were talking about. It turns out to be quite an enigmatic term. Um, QM designates uh, the, what was obvious, what's the QM quality management system, but it's also an integrity level. And what is an integrity level? Well, that basically means that the quality management system um, has a um, produced a component uh, with integrity equivalent to a commercial component. And over and above that, the QM qualification process involves demonstrating that the open source quality uh, management process uh, is essentially equivalent to the quality management process uh, required by ISO 26262. So what does uh, 26262 actually say about um, QM? First of all, sort of the obvious, uh, the system integrator has to have a quality management system that's compliant with IATF 16949 in conjunction with ISO 9001. Uh, ISO 9001 is probably reasonably well known uh, as a quality management system uh, certification standard. 
and IATF 16949 is the uh, automotive industry um, adaptation uh, in the international context for quality management system. That means that um, there are there were um, different standards in different geographical areas for automotive uh, quality systems, in, say in Japan or North America or in Europe. And this uh, IATF standard um, amalgamates them all for uh, use across uh, all companies in the world. The next uh, requirement took me a bit by surprise. Um, 26.262 has a, a way of classifying hazards based on yeah how likely it is that you're going to encounter that uh, hazard, how severe the harm is to people's lives or uh, well-being um, resulting from the hazard and the ability of the driver to control uh, the situation and avoid uh, the, the damage. And the standard says, well, if um, the uh, hazard is a uh, it's not that dangerous. If it doesn't uh, uh, look like it will cause much harm, then you can handle the safety critical functionality to support that uh, with the quality management system in force in the company. Uh, it's BOG's uh, standard uh, quality management system. Um, regardless of that, uh, all functions in the system uh, that have no safety requirements would, uh, must be specified according to the quality management system in force. That means that, yeah, um, yeah, there must be a specification for uh, all of this functionality. Um, there can be complex uh, components where you can break them down into a part that's safety critical and a part that's safety uncritical, and then uh, use different measures to, uh, to qualify or certify those components. So, <clears throat> What does the 26262 expect for uh, qualification of a software component? Um, first of all, they gave a definition of component, um, which was nice because they also use a lot of synonyms. There's everything from items or elements or systems and systems of systems. Uh, and then uh, there's uh, components. And what they define for a component is that it's uh, actually a unit of functionality, uh, either hardware or software, that can be subjected to um, standalone testing and that it, uh, is defined at the architectural level. Uh, yeah, the definition of component was both for hardware and software and therefore software component is just the same definition with software. <clears throat> so what do you have to do to qualify a, a software component in general? Uh, that means in safety critical applications as well. You have to uh, define uh, the maximum uh, safety integrity that the, the component will uh, expect. Uh, then you have to uh, define the intended use of the component in the system. You have to investigate and describe uh, the known anomalies for the component. Um, you have to uh, specify its functional behavior and then the behavior in different types of uh, exceptional situations. Uh, when the component fails, uh, <clears throat> when the system gets in an overload uh, situation, what does the component do? What are the response time and resource units uh, requirements for the, uh, for the system, uh, for the component? Um, also, you have to document the safety requirements in the current process and uh, yeah, also the numerical accuracy of the component, which yeah, seems like a little bit of a strange uh, uh, requirement in the context of what we're talking about. But actually, the standard was thinking of a software component more in terms of a math library uh, where, yeah, you try to find something like the sine of 60 degrees and get an answer of uh, 0 0.86 um, rather than more complex uh, software components. At any rate, after you've uh, selected the compact, uh, component, then you have to do uh, 
uh, an acceptance test and then uh, in integrated in the system and that's done with the usual uh, procedures that are specified in the standard. So what is the relevance of quality assurance to safety critical system? Well, we have the situation where QM is now considered to be an integrity level uh, and the system in Integrator has a, a quality management system, but or and uh, the open source project uh, only does uh, quality assurance, which means testing and uh, reviews and um, coding standards and things like that. So the question is, how do we achieve QM integrity? The answer is by addressing and eliminating failures in the product. So a little bit of a digression to, uh, to uh, testing 101. Um, there are error chains. Um, I learned this as a mechanical engineer, but I'll take a, a computer science type of an example. Um, a software component can have a fault, which is something like um, a coding error, um, which exists. Uh, but until the uh, code is compiled and linked and installed in a system and the system runs, it doesn't have any effect on uh, the system itself. Um, at that point, when the uh, fault is encountered, uh, it can produce an error. Um, but depending on the type of the error and the type of the system, it may not be critical or interesting to the system itself. You know, when um, when the function returns a value uh, uh, or doesn't in time, uh, doesn't do it in time, then perhaps the last value can be used and is still tolerable. Uh, but then there are uh, errors that lead to some sort of catastrophic event, which would be a failure. And it's the failures that we uh, have to worry about in the safety uh, context. So what are the... Uh, possible causes of errors. Uh, first of all, there's what I just said, erroneous functionality. There are also hardware errors that occur from random events like uh, uh, radiation or uh, cold uh, that affect the, the hardware. There are systematic errors where the uh, failure doesn't occur in the, the component itself. The component itself is correct, but another uh, component is uh, incorrect and uh, yeah, the uh, failure cascades uh, to the uh, component under question and in question and uh, yeah causes the component itself to fail and then there are uh, dependent failures where uh, yeah good example is um, uh, when the hardware fails then the, the software will fail too uh, then there are overload situations where um, the system is not uh, performant because of uh, lack of uh, processing or memory resources or um, capacity on various communication links. So there are two basic strategies to addressing uh, failures. One is to avoid them and the other is to tolerate them. And how do you avoid them? Well, uh, you try to eliminate them uh, in the development process by um, examining the context and uh, developing appropriate requirements, uh, developing uh, measures to um, uh, eliminate them, uh, to avoid uh, particular areas errors being introduced into the, the software uh, through review processes and, and testing. Um, yeah, and on the other hand, you can uh, uh, introduce mitigation me mechanisms to tolerate um, failures that occur when the system is running. First of all, you can use encapsulation to um, uh, avoid, uh, to put uh, particular functionality in a partition that cannot be, uh, that does not access uh, the safety critical functionality and does not influence it in any way. Uh, you can have redundancy strategies where you have more uh, than one uh, example of a component and then um, if one uh, instance fails, then uh, another can replace it. 
Uh, you can have diversity to detect uh, systematic uh, errors. That means a good example of that would be uh, to take a component and compile it under uh, as 32-bit or 64-bit uh, and have two different components. Uh, and then because there are different memory man mappings and possibly different um, uh, instructions being used, uh, the probability of the two components uh, having the same failure, uh, same behavior, uh, incorrect behavior at the same time are lowered. Um, you can uh, monitor the performance of the, the system. You can introduce checkpoints and validate the the system uh, is uh, producing correct results, or you can take a look at the resource consumption in order to um, detect the causes of these problems. You can have diagnostics. In the worst case, you can have a watchdog uh, that resets the system when it uh, doesn't respond. And uh, in certain cases, you can substitute a, a more per performant uh, functionality with a less performant functionality. Uh, and uh, have a limp home mode um, for the system. So yeah, this is a, a compliant development process for safety applications. And the basic idea is uh, yeah, that uh, the system integrator defines the system in, in its context and looks at the hazards that occurs and then defines safety mechanisms and safety functions. That uh, produces a safety concept. Uh, then, um, yeah, uh, these safety functions and safety mechanisms are uh, defined in the architecture. And then at the architectural level, um, you allocate the, the safety criticality uh, to the particular architectural uh, elements and then uh, technical safety requirements like uh, response time or uh, um, resource consumption to those elements. Then you develop the safety mechanisms um, uh, and you do that with the measures and techniques uh, that are uh, courts that have the, the rigor required for the particular integrity levels. After that, um, you have to verify the, uh, the that the requirements have been uh, made through testing. So the idea of uh, the testing is that uh, yeah, you follow the, uh, the requirements from the architectural level through the design and the implementation, and then you devise um, unit tests and integration tests that verify those uh, requirements. So there's the traceability down through the development process um, uh, for the requirements and across uh, the to the corresponding development steps in the verification. So now we're going to look at how to qualify uh, a software compute component at uh, the QM level. What does that mean? Well, it means that uh, yeah, the system integrator will want to demonstrate to itself or uh, in uh, after that to the uh, accreditation agency with sufficient assurance that all interfaces of the open source component have been developed and are being maintained to an industrial level of quality, that it's an industrial uh, strength component. And that would make it uh, suitable for integration in a safety critical system. And the special aspects of uh, QM are that uh, you still have to consider all of the error mode I that can occur that would normally occur in a, uh, a product that is not safety critical, uh, but you can neglect the uh, hazard mitigated functionality. And that uh, is in the context of reuse of a off the shelf component, um, not that's being developed uh, from scratch. And a consideration that we really haven't talked about so far that uh, yeah, you have to consider the hardware on which the software component has previously been used. Um, safety, doesn't, safety community doesn't really believe in write once and run any everywhere. Um, it's obvious that um, uh, 
particular hardware components have uh, particular vulnerabilities and have uh, uh, particular faults and each uh, hardware uh, platform has to be uh, documented and the experience uh, on that uh, platform for the software component has to be documented as well. So at the overall level, there are a number of considerations that uh, don't uh, necessarily uh, influence the strategy. And one of them is simply the source of the source code. Uh, the system integrator has the choice of uh, taking it direct from the project uh, repository or um, from a distributor or some sort of amalgamation. Um, examples of that would be Open ELEC or uh, Debian. Uh, there are two uh, usual sources of uh, source code for safety critical applications. Um, in the first case, then the QMS is only the uh, open source uh, projects QMS, and in this uh, second, it's the amalgam of the uh, uh, distributors uh, QMS and the open source projects QMS. The next consideration is uh, yeah, the essence of 26262. Um, yeah. 26262 was uh, derived from IEC 61508. IEC 61508 is a generic safety standard. It's actually uh, a safety standard for uh, developing, uh, for defining safety standards. Uh, and the idea is that uh, based on the philosophy in 61508, uh, particular uh, industry branches or domains can define a domain-specific standard. And 61508 uh, talks about two types of uh, product that can be certified. Uh, the Type A product um, is a, uh, a well-known product. Uh, the, the failure modes are well-defined, uh, the failure rates are well-defined, and the behavior under fault conditions are well-known and can be completely determined. An example of that might be the uh, uh, an airbag control unit, uh, where uh, we've had uh, airbags for I don't know 30 years now, and they're in most cars, and they come from a various uh, from a variety of um, uh, uh, suppliers and uh, are used in uh, yeah a variety of. Um, uh, automobiles. So yeah, the uh, failure mode of a uh, airbag control unit is well known. Uh, how often it fails is well known and the, uh, you know, the effects and the impacts on uh, uh, the system from a failure are also well known. Uh, IEC 61508 in the case of uh, type A products, then uh, the industry is uh, Welcome to make a, a domain-specific standard. Otherwise, for type B, you should use 61508. And that's the fly in the ointment, because if you take a look at the complex applications that we're talking about, um, such as autonomous driving, uh, you can't say that uh, there are well-defined failure modes or that the failure rates are well-known at the moment, or that the behavior of the failure of a uh, an autonomous driving uh, system uh, uh, has a particular uh, effect on the behavior of the, the car or its environment. Um, but on the other hand, 26262 says that it's uh, applicable to all road vehicles, and then it becomes a question uh, between the accreditation agency and uh, you know, the system and greater what exactly uh, that means. Uh, another consideration is what I uh, briefly talked about uh, before, um, the um, clause in 26262 that addresses uh, component uh, qualification talks about simple components where um, the, uh, the response that you get from an input is not dependent on the state of the, of the component. Uh, in the case of a math library, it's pretty simple. Like I said, it's sine of 60 degrees, a bit of processing, and out comes uh, 0 0.866. Uh, that's not the case in uh, for an operating system. Um, the 
<clears throat> response uh, at a particular interface may depend on the state of scheduling, whether a process has been preempted, uh, whether there's intermittent processing going on, um, yeah, what's happening with the, uh, the memory management, um, and so forth. So, yeah. In this, those cases, you have to take a much closer look at um, what the exact uh, requirements are for uh, time and resource consumption and what uh, the responses must be. And that usually depends on uh, a, a knowledge of uh, the components uh, within the, the subsystem, and that's called white box testing. And like I said previously, um, you have to consider uh, the hardware platform where the system will be run. Um, so uh, when you're looking at QM, you have to account for all the failure uh, modi. So even at, at quality management level. And there the avo avoidance requires something like an industrial development process. In the context of the automotive industry, then uh, that would be um, stipulated by ISO 26262. Um, fault tolerance uh, uh, means that you have to um, define and uh, investigate the faults that occur in uh, while the system is running. And um, two typical safety um, measures for uh, Doing that is to, to identify the relevant faults. It's a failure mode and uh, effects analysis or a fault tree analysis. I won't go into the details of them. Um, after you've uh, <coughs> done those analyses, then you have to take a look at the capability of the fault to tolerance mechanisms that the component has, and then take a look at what uh, the organization's norm normal bog standard a uh, quality management system would require to uh, account for freedom of in from interference and cascading failures, uh, and then uh, assess the gap between those two and uh, yeah, define uh, ways to fill those gaps. So yeah, um, basically the approach depends on the complexity of the component you're looking at. Uh, and ISO 26262 doesn't specifically address um, uh, whether you should use black box or white box testing at a particular integrity level. But <clears throat> what they do say is that at the lowest integrity level, structured-based testing is recommended. And recommended is optional. You don't have to do it. And that, that means that it's a question for the system integrator whether or not uh, they consider it relevant to do. And if that's not the case, then uh, yeah, then you can say that the component is not complex and it can be qualified uh, under the class that we've already seen. If it is, uh, yeah, <clears throat> if it, the uh, QMS uh, in the system integrator requires structure based testing at ACLA, then you have to qualify the component as if it was uh, ACLA. And uh, yeah, I've been a bit of a wag here and said, okay, then if you're doing that, then QM is A cell A minus A or A cell zero. Um, yeah, IEC 61508 has uh, uh, safety integrity levels from one to uh, four, whereby 26262 goes from A to D, and uh, it, the mathematics makes more sense for a SIL, eight, uh, SIL 1 minus 1, then you get a SIL 0. Uh, there again, uh, in the end, uh, you have to verify uh, the component selection uh, with a, an acceptance test and uh, yeah, uh, integration tests as you would normally do according to this. So, uh, well, we discussed uh, uh, the Part, two, part 8 class 12 qualification uh, requirements uh, in slide 11, uh, yeah, basic review here. Uh, you prepare a specification um, of the component, uh, which then serves as the requirements for the component. And then you have to demonstrate that the uh, uh, component complies with that, those requirements. 
Um, over and above that, you have to ensure that the component is suitable for its intended use in the specific product. And that would, again, uh, uh, mean an analysis of uh, the hardware fa failures. Um, and yeah, the component's development process must be compliant in some way with a recognized standard. Um, what uh, ISO 26262 says is that you could also look at IEC ISO 12207. Uh, which is a software uh, development process standard, which is interesting because uh, yeah, things like ISO 9001 are pretty binary. Either you're compliant or you're not. But um, in 12207, um, you can say, well, um, in this process area, what do I know? Configuration management, um, we're compliant, but in this other one, uh, we haven't quite made it like in review processes may not be thorough enough. And then you can document that and say, okay, we've partially achieved compliance. And then it would be up to the system integrator to take a look at that and decide whether or not um, additional measures need to be taken um, to ensure that the overall compliance of the system is met. And so, yeah, basically you have to prepare and execute uh, a plan to, um, uh, accept the, the, the component and integrate it into the, the On the other hand, if you take the hypothesis that, uh, yeah, we have a safety critical element uh, that isn't safety critical, um, then you would follow the ACLA minus A approach. And what the standard does say is that um, when you have a safety critical element, uh, yeah, the integrity levels are just for particular control flows through the component where they have to meet uh, particular timing requirements or resource requirements. Um, and the rest of the uh, the component, uh, yeah, should be uh, ASIL. Um, and that means that, uh, yeah, if you have an element that doesn't have any uh, integrity requirements, then you still have to uh, uh, produce it at the rigor required for that ASIL level. Um, you also have to account for all of the error modalities that are listed in the, in the quality management system previously. And yeah, if you were doing this by the book, then you, the components QMS should be equivalent to IATF 6949 plus ISO 9001. Um, yeah, the first thing is that it's typical uh, auto industry practice to substitute an A-SPICE assessment for the 9001 uh, certification. A-SPICE is an automa automotive uh, standard for assessing the maturity of a development process, which means uh, that uh, a customer is assured of getting uh, the um, product that the supplier commits to. Um, <clears throat> In the case of a QM open source component, perhaps you could drop the IATF 16949 part of it and simply try to certify it under 9, ISO 9001 or even uh, in uh, ISO IEC 12207 uh, as would be done uh, in the qualification cause. Um, or yeah, you could try to accredit it at uh, a spice level two which is a relatively low level of maturity so what does this mean for linux well everybody i talk about uh who wants to put linux in uh in safety critical applications believes in linux uh, there's yeah linux is in all kinds of um, uh, high availability um, applications um, and also in um, all kinds of embedded systems like routers and uh, that uh, have to be reliable. Nobody really doubts that uh, um, it that Linux has the requisite uh, uh, quality uh, to um, and reliability uh, to be put in a safety critical system, but Unfortunately, safety standards requires that uh, one demonstrate the integrity of the system. And integrity is a, a matter of the, the technical product properties and of reliable implementation. 
Um, yeah, so uh, it means that uh, the error handling uh, within the software uh, has to be reliable and uh, the system has to be stable. Um, and the system, the, the development process must uh, avoid uh, bugs as much as possible. But yeah, regardless of what you believe, you still have to demonstrate it or prove it. And that, in order to do that, you need evidence. So where could you get this uh, evidence? Well, when you're taking a look at uh, whether or not the kernel development process is suitable, there is a uh, definition at kernel.org. And uh, you could compare that to uh, the requirements in 26262 and see how far uh, they agree. Other than that, there are other parts of the, the uh, development process, uh, like requirements and design that are done within the community, but not necessarily reflected in, in uh, the development process uh, at kernel.org. At, at kernel and it may be possible for particular parts of, the, of Linux to uh, ask the community for additional information uh, to support um, the certification effort. And then, uh, well, for technical properties themselves, uh, basically you're going to have to uh, do it yourself. And define the requirements uh, uh, that could be um, put on the kernel for safety critical functionality. And then you would basically do that by looking at uh, defining a use case and look at, at uh, typical applications of uh, safety critical software in embedded systems and see what uh, the functional requirements and uh, control flow requirements are on the Linux kernel. I mean, which interfaces in the Linux kernel are being used. And yeah, in order to understand those uh, interfaces, then you're going to have to uh, look at the architectural requirements and understand how the kernel would be integrated into the system in general. <clears throat> so yeah. Uh, if you look at the requirements management uh, requirements in the standard, you could uh, look, you could mine uh, discussions in user groups and mailing lists, but unfortunately there is no defined set of valid requirements and the, these requirements are needed uh, to trace the, uh, uh, to be traced uh, through the development process to validate the testing and uh, uh, the, the functionality that's produced by the development process. Uh, similarly, there's no uh, central architecture model. Um, yeah, basically, um, Linux was uh, uh, developed ad hoc based on you know, diff uh, different examples of different uh, Unix systems and other academic systems like Minix at the time. Um, it wasn't uh, <coughs> designed top down uh, from the architectural model. Um, probably the, for me, the, the biggest failing of, of Linux at the moment is that uh, there's good quality, you know, focus on quality assurance, meaning uh, testing and coding guidelines and uh, continuous integration, uh, configuration management. But when you ask, yeah, what is the, the quality of the system that is produced by the development process? How good is Linux at meeting the requirements? Uh, yeah, it's not really known. And then the next question is, yeah, if the, the quality is not sufficient, what do you have to do to get it to be sufficient? What uh, things can, can you do? And there again, uh, that's not the way the open source community works. If the quality is unsatisfactory, then uh, you uh, have to uh, introduce your own measures to improve the, the, the process and perhaps uh, submit a new patch with the appropriate uh, functionality. Um, over and above that, um, yeah, what can I say? Linux is more agile than the, the waterfall uh, models that the, the state standards seem to uh, prefer. And when you take a look at it, uh, yeah, you can often argue that it produces the same results. And the Linux development process has strengths in functional development and testing and configuration management. Git is probably the best 
uh, configuration management system in the world. Uh, there are small weaknesses in the, in the requirements and traceability and, and change management, exactly how uh, a, a change gets proposed and uh, approved and uh, implemented. Uh, is not formally defined and uh, yeah, there's no uh, tracking that it's consistently done in a particular way. Um, yeah, and then there are larger weaknesses uh, that uh, um, requirements uh, definition is, is not done at all and uh, that the architecture is not defined and that makes the requirement traceability much more difficult. So uh, you can also take a look at uh, what the facilities are that are already in the, the kernel. And there are facilities for freedom from interference. Um, yeah, second, for, for example, um, <clears throat> limits the system interfaces that can be called by an application uh, after a certain point, uh, there are container technologies, uh, which for, for uh, different processes, uh, depending on their uh, their group, uh, they have uh, ac different accesses to accessibilities to uh, different resources, uh, which is regulated by control groups and namespaces and access controls. Uh, there are robustness facilities, uh, Linux has a watchdog functionality and logging and diagnosis. So yeah, it's not like you're starting from square one. Uh, there are things there that just have to be identified and defined and uh, then uh, brought into the context of uh, safety uh, qualification or certification. So uh, a little bit about the ELISA project. Um, the ELISA project uh, is developed, divided into three working groups at the moment. Um, and yeah, basically uh, there are domain specific uh, working groups for automotive and for uh, medical at the moment. And these um, domain specific uh, work groups should provide use cases where the Use cases uh, basically are a safety app running on user space libs and somehow rather than this um, diagram, they've, they, they've forgotten the obvious the user space libs are on top of Linux and uh, yeah, Linux is running on particular hardware. Um, the use cases uh, contribute a, a safety function definition uh, for that domain and then uh, some idea of the uh, context in which these uh, safety applications are running, uh, so that man can, uh, so that one can um, uh, validate or understand uh, the uh, technical safety requirements that the domain have for a particular part of Linux and the architectural assumptions that uh, go into that. Um, yeah. The architectural group takes uh, the technical safety requirements and the architectural assumptions and looks at how that would be partitioned uh, to um, facilitate the, the different uh, safety mechanisms. Um, they also look at uh, you know, the uh, particular uh, freedom from interference and fault uh, uh, mode uh, analyses that could be done for the Linux and uh, they will in the future define uh, safety requirements uh, that can be allocated uh, uh, to the kernel to ensure integrity features and um, provide conditions of use uh, for uh, Linux safety mechanisms. That means uh, describing uh, the things that you have to do in order to use the, the Linux safety mechanisms safely in a particular product. The process working group is looking at how to um, uh, demonstrate that uh, the Linux uh, um, development process is uh, equivalent to uh, the development processes that um, uh, that the standards uh, expect, and um, they're also working on Linux qualification. 
So <clears throat> what have they achieved so far? Eliza has been running for a year. Um, the process group has uh, defined a, a reference process that uh, combines uh, the aspects of a number of safety standards and then they've uh, surveyed the Linux development activities uh, with respect to those uh, reference processes and uh, are defining an initial gap. Um, they're also doing work on patch uh, impact testing and, and uh, mining the kernel uh, as I explained before. Um, patch impact t testing quickly is when a, uh, <clears throat> uh, a patch is accepted for a, a current release, then it's um, backported to uh, uh, various uh, long-term uh, Linux uh, versions. And uh, yeah, the uh, system integrator has to constantly assess whether or not a particular patch in the current release affects the long-term um, release that it is using. Uh, over and above that, the process group is doing a survey of uh, static analysis activities in the Linux development process at the moment. The architecture group has identified a, uh, an investig an, are investigating a number of uh, architecture variants with uh, hypervisors or coprocessor or container technologies, and they're now working on a particular uh, memory management uh, uh, safety app uh, as a demonstrator. Um, the automotive working group has just formed and uh, yeah, they're working with the automotive grade Linux project, uh, taking a pilot application that uh, AGL has defined and um, uh, working with the architecture group to look at the, uh, the safety aspects of that pilot application. The medical devices working group has started examining the uh, artificial pancreas uh, system, which is uh, a system that takes uh, uh, a blood sugar measurement device and uh, a, an insulin pump and combines them with a Raspberry Pi so that the uh, blood sugar in the blood level remains uh, acceptable automatically, it prevents the di a diabetic from having to measure it himself. And, uh, inject insulin. Uh, they're all appropriate to the uh, coronavirus problem at the moment. Uh, uh, the group has also st uh, started to examine uh, open source ventilate. So that's pretty well it. What have we learned? Well, Linux is soup. And uh, yeah, it's not QM out of the box. Uh, but yeah. Uh, a, a purebred dog is uh, not better than, a, or a, a mongrel is not necessarily less of a dog than a, a purebred. And uh, in this uh, sense, uh, there is nothing to say that Linux is not uh, as good at QM level as a, um, a, a commercially developed product. Um, yeah, similarly, you would think from the title that QM is a, a uh, an issue for the development process, but that's not true. It's an integrity measure and uh, there are uh, the uh, aspects of fault tolerance. Uh, you've probably seen the safety accreditation is not simple, it's exacting and demanding. And that QM qualification itself is a, a massive amount of work, but uh, because it's not safety critical, it doesn't really depend on any particular safety use case. And it's a, uh, an area where different companies should um, be able to cooperate. Uh, so the outlook is uh, that the ELISA project is working on the topics that we've talked about today. The Zephyr project is an open source um, Artas project uh, also under the Linux Foundation and they have a, bet, a more uh, conformant uh, development process and they're uh, closer to uh, cert safety certification at a higher uh, integrity level. Regardless of that, um, there are, we will need new uh, certification pro approaches um, for open source software because the old ones are not necessarily appropriate. Thank you uh, for paying attention. That um, ends my uh, presentation and now I'd be glad to talk to you and address your questions.